So now let's talk about who benefits and who loses from the fracking boom or the welfare and distributional impacts of the shale gas boom. So the agenda for this is who are the winners and who are the losers, losers from increased natural gas production? Let's remind ourselves what we talked about in the previous uh, part of this module. Natural gas prices in the U.S. have been declining due to the shale fracking boom. So this graph shows what we're talking about. Um, the, the dark black line is the natural gas production from uh, um, all over the U.S. The dotted line is the natural gas production from shale. And you can see that uh, natural gas production started to increase around 2006, uh, and that's primarily due to the increase in production from shale. Uh, you can see there's no shale production prior to 2006, and that's because uh, it hadn't really been invented prior to 2006. You can also see the subsequent drop in natural gas prices uh, after the, the shale gas boom. The, the large drop is from the recession, but the fact that it remains so low uh, relative to pre-recession period prices, this is, I'm talking about the orange line, the fact that it remains so low is because there has been uh, inc an increase in production in the U.S. So we're going to talk about uh, what were the welfare consequences of this price decline. So who were the winners and who were the losers from the fracking boom? The winners are electricity consumers. Uh, people or companies that use electricity that is produced with natural gas and of course if the natural gas price drops that means the electricity price must drop as well as long as the electricity the, the natural gas drop price drop is passed through to electricity prices this will hold true the manufacturers that use natural gas as an input to production so if you uh, use natural gas to heat up steel or iron or something um, you're going to benefit because your input costs have gone down and then the shale gas producers, of course, are winners because they are uh, they were not producing gas before, and all of a sudden they are. They're making money off this. So who are the losers? The losers are coal producers because coal producers are the primary competitors. If natural gas prices decline, then coal uh, is uh, the competition uh, is much higher for coal producers. Uh, the also. The losers would be the owners of the coal electricity generation. So if you own a coal uh, electricity power plant, um, you're worried because electricity from natural gas is, uh, is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Uh, your competition is becoming uh, stronger and stronger. Owners of wind and solar generators are losers as well. Same reason that the coal producers are suffering. Um, as the price declines, uh, price of natural gas declines, then natural gas becomes um, the the go-to for electricity production rather than wind and solar. Wind and solar would like all the prices of uh, the other um, generation types to increase so that wind and solar prices look more profitable. And then conventional natu natural gas producers are suffering as well. These are the natural gas producers that produce from conventional wells, not fracking wells. So the paper we were, go we were going to talk about in this section is by Hausman and Kellogg, and, and they wrote it in 2015. And their question is, what are the welfare consequences of the fracking boom and lower natural gas prices? I've asked you to read parts of this paper, not the whole thing. I don't expect you to know what they're doing in the whole part, in the whole paper. Um, but particularly, I want you to know what they're doing with the welfare section of the paper, the introduction, uh, and then there's a, a nice couple paragraphs on an intro to the natural gas market. Um, also, I want you to think about the externalities, and that's uh, section six of their paper. So let's remind ourselves, when, when economists talk about welfare, what are we talking about? Uh, we're talking about producer surplus, consumer surplus, and externality costs. Welfare is just the sum of these components. It's the sum of the producer surplus, the sum of the consumer surplus, and the, and the externality costs. Uh, and so of, oftentimes economists try to put numbers on these values. So what these authors are going to do is they're going to look at the market uh, for natural gas and estimate 
the producer surplus had the prices not gone down um, versus the the prices uh, the price decline uh, that we've experienced. So how much do producers gain or lose uh, based on this price decline? How much do consumers gain or lose based on the price decline? And what are the externality costs of the increased consumption? So consumer surplus here, let's look at their table three here. We've, they've estimated the consumer surplus. This is the change in consumer surplus before spillovers by region uh, from 2007 to 13. This is a consumer surplus uh, in dollars per year per person. So what are we looking at? We have different regions of the US and importantly, different parts of the US experience different uh, changes in consumer surplus. Why? So we have a residential sector. The residential sector is going to benefit um, for, from lower natural gas prices, primarily in colder areas where natural gas is used for heating. And that's what we're going to see in these numbers. So New England, the Mid-Atlantic, East, North, Central, these are areas where it's colder in the winter and, and people use more natural gas for heating. The commercial areas, on the other hand, or commercial is going to be relatively the same as residential um, because commercial, we're talking about heating of buildings. Industrial is where it's slightly different. Industrial, uh, we see um, the benefits accruing to the industrial sector in the West South Central. Um, and the West South Central includes Arkansas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Texas. Why is that the case? Well, that's, that's where a lot of the industrial production in the US occurs and a lot of it uses natural gas as an input. So as their inputs decline, input prices decline, then they benefit quite a bit. And we, we hope that those uh, price declines are passed along to consumers. Electric power as well, uh, that's gonna be the consumers of electric power, that's gonna, we're going to see benefits there where a lot of natural gas is used for electric power production. Again, that's the, the East South Central uh, and West South Central. Okay, so then they ask, we see declines in the natural gas price. Have those declines in the natural gas price been passed through to consumers. What do we mean by pass through? Uh, the pass through is, let's suppose um, you're a, a natural gas consumer. You own a, a house and you have to heat your home with natural gas. If the price of natural gas declines by $1 per unit uh, and the supplier of your natural gas is all of a sudden paying $1 less per unit of natural gas, do you as the consumer also see a decline of $1 per unit in, in your natural gas bill? Uh, that would be full pass-through or one-to-one -one pass through. Uh, if, if we see less than that, let's suppose uh, the price of natural gas declines by $1 or increases by $1, then um, and you see less than that pass through to you as a consumer, then you can assume that some of that benefit is being held on to by your supplier. So the intermediary, the one that's purchasing, uh, the wholesale distributor that's purchasing um, natural gas from the uh, producer and selling it to you. Uh, they are benefiting from that decline in prices. You so, so to put this into more concrete terms, the price of natural gas declines by $1 um, and you only see a 50 cent decline in your bill per unit. Uh, that would mean that 50 cents of that price decline is being held onto by the, the supplier. So they are benefiting. Houseman and Kellogg estimate the pass-through rates. Um, basically what you should take away from this table is that most of these numbers are around one. This means that there is about a one-to-one -one, uh, pass-through rate of changes in the natural gas price being passed through to the residential, commercial, industrial, and electric power sectors. Uh, these are these numbers aren't exactly one, but that's uh, statistical noise. The, uh, the values in the parentheses are the standard errors, and if we uh, look at the T-stats on these, then they would uh, 
we couldn't rule out that these are statistically different from one. So we find that there, are, there is basically one to one pass through. Now let's look at producer surplus. Um, the authors state that um, for consumer surplus, what they really care about is the change in prices. For producer surplus, however, they have to think about the change in the or the shift in the supply curve as well, uh, right? Because if you were a shale gas producer, then you produced ver no shale uh, frac shale gas or fracking prior to 2007 because it didn't exist, um, and so we have to consider the production, the increase in, in quantity supplied by the uh, the shale gas producers, as well as the price change. And so what this table shows is the uh, change in producer surplus among the states where most of the natural gas is produced in the United States. Some of these are positive changes and some are negative changes. Why is that the case? Well, some states were producing natural gas before the shale gas revolution, right? Those are conventional uh, natural gas producers, the ones that produce natural gas without fracking. Those places are probably going to be harmed by this because uh, they were already producing natural gas, but all of a sudden a bunch of other states come online uh, and start producing natural gas at, uh, at cheaper and selling uh, natural gas on the market at a cheaper price. And so the states that were producing at a higher price are now suffering because a, a new competitor has come in and pushed prices down. So that's what you see in places like Colorado where we were already producing natural gas and then all of a sudden prices decline. The conventional producers in Colorado therefore suffer. Places like Pennsylvania um, and West Virginia in Arkansas, they benefited because there was virtually no uh, natural gas production in those uh, areas to begin with. Uh, and then fracking comes in and, and uh, all of a sudden we get a shift out in the uh, natural gas supplied by fracking, um, shift out in the supply curve. And so therefore those places see a benefit. So in general, um, the producers of natural gas are actually being harmed by this because they're they're forced to sell their natural gas at a lower price. Next, the authors are asking, how do the gas intensive sectors respond to the change in natural gas prices? So what they do is they break down the industries by how gas intensive they are, how much gas they use per unit of or dollar of output. Uh, or dollar of uh, thing that they produce. And they can break this down by uh, the percentile. So the top rows in this table, table seven, are uh, industries below the 90th percentile of gas intensity. The second set of uh, results are industries above the 90th percentile. And then the third would be above the 95th percentile. And then finally, fertilizer. And fertilizer, they, they separate because it's the most gas intensive uh, industry out of all the industries. And that's because it uses ammonia, which is produced from natural gas. The first thing to notice um, are the time periods they're looking at. So 2002 to 2007 is sort of the, the comparison time period. And 2007 to 2012 is the period where fracking really took place uh, or really boomed. It also includes the Great Recession. And so we see in the top rows here that for the, uh, the sectors with natural gas intensity below the 90th percentile, we see during the recession period, we see declines in the number of establish establishments, declines in employment, and declines in employee compensation uh, across the board here. Um, but if we look at um, the same for uh, sectors with natural gas intensity above the 90th or 95th percentile, we see we, we see either lower declines in these uh, these values or even increases to, uh, in, for sectors above the 95th percentile of intensity. For for example, number of establishments and employee compensation. Um, we can see if we look at capital expenditures. Uh, the far right, 
uh, even during the recession, it looks like um, sectors uh, with natural gas intensity below the 90th percentile were actually in expanding. They were investing in capital expenditures between 2007 and 2012 um, with a value of 4.9 uh, percentage points. Uh, but um, sectors with natural gas intensity above the 90th percentile, more intensive uh, natural gas uh, consumers were expanding more. Their capital expenditures were almost twice as much. Most notably, however, is the fertilizer sector. Uh, between During the fracking boom, it had expanded the number of, of establishments, employment, employee compensation dramatically increased, and capital expenditures increased by 232.7 percentage points. So fertilizer has been booming. Let's look at this on, uh, on a graph. The key here is that ammonia prices are determined in a global market. They aren't tied to the natural gas prices. And that's because ammonia is transportable. Um, and so this graph shows the ammonia prices, essentially the green or black line here, uh, versus the Henry Hub gas prices, natural gas prices. And you can see the recession had a negative, negative effect on both prices. That's the 2008 recession. But after that, the prices diverged substantially. Natural gas prices stay low and even declined even more just uh, in 2012, while uh, ammonia prices are continuing to increase as the global economy recovers. Uh, and so this led to large profits for ammonia producers because they're purchasing cheap natural gas as an input and selling ammonia, uh, the, their output, at really high prices. So let's summarize what we've, what we've learned from this paper. What were the impacts of the development of the shale gas boom in the U.S.? Natural gas consumers were better off by about $74 billion per year. The manufacturing industries using natural gas as an input increased their employment and investment relative to other industries. Natural gas producers were worse off by about $26 billion per year. And that's because uh, we're talking about nat conventional natural gas producers. Of course, the shale gas producers benefited, but there were more conventional nat natural gas producers who, who suffered. And so the, the net uh, producer surplus is uh, a loss of about $26 billion per year. So the private welfare effects are positive. The net benefits here, the $74 billion minus $26 billion, that's going to be a positive amount. And that's the private welfare effects. But the overall welfare depends on the externalities associated with increased natural gas production. If we're going to talk about overall welfare, we need to talk about the social benefits. So what are the environmental externalities associated with higher natu natural gas production? There's effects on global climate change. There's additional methane leaks throughout the supply chain. Methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's much more potent than CO2. Uh, and by producing more natural gas, which is methane, we, we are therefore leaking natural gas into the uh, atmosphere. We're leaking methane into the atmosphere. There's substitution of coal with natural gas for electricity generation. This is actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions from electricity production. These are direct emissions. So um, the production of uh, electricity with coal is much more CO2 intensive than production of electricity from natural gas. But we have to consider the life cycle emissions and those life cycle emissions would include the first bullet point, the additional methane leak. So it's unclear whether natural gas is, is um, overall less emissions intensive than coal when we consider the full life cycle. But what happened to the coal that is no longer burned in the U.S.? Right, so we see a decline in coal electricity uh, production. Does that coal just sit in the ground? No, it gets shipped over to China. It gets shipped over to India where they burn it. So we're, we're consuming less coal in the U.S., but it's still being consumed uh, elsewhere in the, in the world. And uh, climate change is a global problem, so even if um, India is producing CO2 or, or China is producing CO2, it affects us. 
In contrast, what about the local environmental effects from fracking? So well, there's water contamination during the fracking process. Um, and we also have wastewater water byproducts. Uh, the fracking process is, is depends on shooting water uh, mixed with chemicals underground, so we're therefore um, affecting the groundwater. Uh, there's local air quality effects. Uh, we, you get methane releases, ozone releases from fracking. Uh, there's an increase in traffic and noise around sites. Um, earthquakes associated with wastewater injection. Um, there's fracking actually causes earthquakes. And there's some research showing here, research even at CSU showing that lower student, there's lower student test scores around fracking sites. And that's probably due to increased traffic and noise around the sites, maybe some to air quality effects. It's difficult to quantify the welfare effects associated with these phenomena. And so the authors chose not to do so. There are other papers out there that attempt to do this. Um, and you can uh, look those up if you want. Here's a little uh, graph to convince you that fracking increases earthquakes. These are the Oklahoma, earthquakes in Oklahoma of magnitude 3.0 and greater, the number per year. Um, you can see after the fracking boom, uh, the amount of earthquakes in Oklahoma has substantially increased. So that uh, concludes the fracking section. I will post a midterm review. Midterms are uh, coming up next, and we'll see you later.